Welcome to Resonance FM. Hello and welcome to Renaissance FM on Resonance 104.4 FM. This is Richard McKenzie, your guest host for this morning's programme, covering for Lady Lovely Loot, a.k.a. Stephanie Feeney, who is currently absent. I'm, I'm not sure where she is, but she's, um, she's certainly not here, that's for sure. And uh, I have a guest with me this time, unlike the last time that I was here. And this guest is uh, Tamsin Lewis. Hello, Tamsin. Hi, Richard. <laughs> and Tamsin comes to me from uh, a group w which I'm also a member of, incidentally, um, but we're going to focus less on that, um, called uh, Pat Sumetso. And could you tell us a little bit about Pat Sumetso, Tamsin? Yes, Pat, Pat Sumetso is an early music ensemble that specialises particularly in English music of the 16th and 17th centuries. And could you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you play in this ensemble and... I, I'm, I trained as a violinist, and for the most part in the ensemble I play violin. I do a bit of viols and some singing also. And the others in the group are lutenists, singers, viol players, recorder players, and always an actor. Oh, excellent. And do you always arrange the programmes yourself? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> Those themed programmes are fun. Themed programmes are most definitely fun. And uh, we, we're going to talk today about a recording project that took place with the group back in October that was recorded in St. John's Wood Church. Um, and uh, who was the composer that was the focus, or, or poet? Who, who was the focus of this recording project? It, it was a recording of James Shirley. He was a 17th century playwright and poet born at the end of Queen Elizabeth's reign, and he died of exposure at, after the Great Fire, oh which a is grim promising. Yeah. Um, he survived the plague and then died of that. Died of that. Mm. But he wrote beautiful words, and many of them were set to music by the great composers of the time. Oh, and who were the great composers at the time? There's a great deal of laws in this, in particular he Henry Laws. Henry Laws, OK. And William Laws. And William Laws. Were they related? Brothers. Brothers, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, do we have any examples that we'd like to play? Is there, is there anything? Can we hear yes, anything Yes, although from I'd this like disc? to start, first of all, mm -hmm. with something humorous. Mm -hmm. um, a song for, a round from his play, The Bird in the Cage, called There Was an Invisible Fox. And does the play The Bird in the Cage survive? All the words survive, but we don't, unfortunately, have most of the music. Oh, that's a shame. We have, fr from the plays, we have just over half a dozen songs and ballads, mm -hmm. although there are references to a great deal more. Uh, um, we have lyrics, but no surviving music sources. And then also a lot of places where Shirley will say, and now a song, but we don't know what the song what might the song be. Was. <laughs> except that he also left volumes of poems, and as some of the songs written down in the plays also appear in the poetry collections, it's likely that many of the other poems that we can't be certain are from the plays, maybe. OK. So can we... So let us have the invisible <laughs> fox. An invisible fox who met with some geese and charged the money to teach them an invisible dance. <laughs> There was an invisible fox by chance Did meet with two visible, visible geese He taught them a fine invisible dance For a hundred, hundred crowns apiece Invisible all but his hand he would go But visible all but his hand he would go But where is it when he was left he would go but fair is fair, and it's fair you must die. But a fair, fair, fair feels the sign. But yet a sad bit is fair, which is fair. But fair is fair, and it's fair, and it's fair you must die. The invisible twins is in the world again. But the invisible twins is in the world again. The invisible clouds return again. Invisible, invisible, all together. Well, that song, having appeared in the play, became so popular that it was sung in taverns 
as a, as around. You've just heard, unusually, as you're used to hearing him playing the lute, Richard singing, along with Peter Wilcock, Richard De Winter, and David De Winter. And you mentioned the word round. In that context, what does that mean? Some of our audience might not know what that word means. A round is a song where everyone sings the same song, but you start at different times. Uh, so the music so is identical for everybody. That, that's right. So everyone coming... sang the same song, but as you heard, it made so, good harmony. So like London's Burning, for example. That's right, which go. is... A classic example. Classic of example. <laughs> so how did this project come about? Well, there's, there's there are scholars all around the world currently working on a complete works of James Shirley. It's a multi-volume edition that will be produced by Oxford University Press. And Dr Andrew Ashby was asked to do an edition of all the music collect, connected with Shirley. Mm -hmm. And he came up with the idea that it would be rather nice to hear the music as well as just reading it. <laughs> Um, he and Dr. Eva Griffith, who was also working on the project, contacted me and having having heard what Passamezzo sounded like and they thought that we would be a good group the right, to play. The right group for the job. <laughs> Absolutely. Because although this is theatre music and in some cases mask music, I'll talk about masks later, we're playing it on a smaller scale, on a very domestic scale, which is something that Passamezzo does a lot. Mm -hmm. Sort of one to a part. One, one to a part, and the sort of thing that you might play in additions at home. Yes. That a family might play for pleasure after supper, rather than grand things with ten lutenists or whatever. <laughs> yeah, something, something gargantuan and highly expensive. Absolutely. <laughs> so, how much of this music survives? Very little. Um, as I was saying, we have a lot of the songs, the words, but the for the most part, there the word music doesn't survive, or else it must be traced. So by going through collections of rounds, you might suddenly find here are lyrics that I've seen in a play, oh, okay. and yes. that way you can put it back together. Or again, with round with ballads, which are popular songs you might find a ballad sheet that has the words that you see in the play, <laughs> and that way you can put it together that way. But also there are manuscript collections of music, and the next song that, I, that we'll play, which is called Would You Know What's Soft, is one of Shirley's poems that's found in his, his 1646 volume that, again, may have come from a play. Mm -hmm. we, we can't be certain. And this was set both by William Laws, who I spoke of earlier, and also in this anonymous setting, which is really rather beautiful. Here you'll hear Emily Atkinson singing Would You Know What's Soft, Alison Kinder playing bass viol, and Richard on the lute. <laughs> So you mentioned that that was a ballad, and I was, I was just wondering, are there any particularly famous ballads that some members of the audience who are possibly less familiar with the genre be able to relate to or know? 
I suppose the most famous ballad that everyone would know is Greensleeves. Oh, yes. OK. Which was printed at the end of Elizabeth's reign in the 1580s. OK. And ballads like that, the tune would then be used for different sets of words. And on our CD, we have a number of ballads where we have used a ballad tune and then matched the words to it. And then matched it. the words to the tune. OK, I understand. The next song we'll give you isn't a ballad, but it's it's definitely a rather popular-sounding song. <laughs> it's, it's very cheerful. It's quite strange. It's What Would My Mistress Do With Hair? And most love songs speak of the beauty of the one they're speaking about. But this one, well, in, in Shirley's poems, he describes it as on one that loved none but deformed woman. <laughs> the, the song appears in Shirley's play, The Duke, Miss, Duke's Mistress, and the singer is saying he doesn't want someone with fashionably frizzed hair. He wants her forehead to be wrinkled and, and indeed so ugly that not even the devil would cuckold him. What should my mistress do with hair? A frizzling curling I can spare. But let her forehead be well ploughed and hemp within those furrows sewed. Oh, give me such a face, such a grace. No two should in spot or in wet rock Should conceal her ears, which I would have at length appear, and those should hang in comely wise, the wealthy pearls of both her eyes. Oh, give me such, such a face, face, such a grace, no two should in sport or in bread. And who was singing that, Tam? It was sung by Richard de Winter, and the chorus was by Emily Atkinson and Peter Wilcock, with Richard and Ali playing the continuo. Excellent stuff. And is I've... Richard also the actor that you mentioned before? Yes, Richard's the actor. OK, and it's, it, it's uh, unusual having an actor singer within the context of a group like this, isn't it? I, I always like to have an actor singer because... Mm. I think the words can be got across much better. Yes, he, he certainly is very clear and he puts a lot of emotion into the way that he delivers it, things. It, mm. for, for me, it means that you can make early music accessible to people who mightn't otherwise listen to it if they can hear the stories. Yes, the, uh, apologies, uh, listeners, that was my stomach if you heard that. Moving swiftly onwards. <laughs> the, the other thing that I've realised we haven't said is that m m most of this music... And indeed, most of the music on the CD hasn't been recorded before. So uh, you, you are, in fact, hearing this music for the first time the as the CD itself time. hasn't been released yet. That's wonderful. It's, a, it's an honour for Renaissance FM. And uh, it's um, fantastically obscure music. And so this is, this is modern premiere. Absolutely. It's excellent stuff. And we, we like them on this show. <laughs> and so Shirley also wrote music for masks. You mentioned masks before now. Can you explain what a mask is? A mask was a spectacular entertainment, usually at the court for a grand occasion, for a wedding 
or to please an ambassador. And it was an all singing, all dancing, wonderful props and scenery and costumes. Not you, cheap. Not, not cheap. <laughs> I think the mask that we're going to do most of, the mask of peace may have cost us, the triumph of peace may have cost as much as £21,000 wow. in those days, which now would was, run into the millions. So was it invitation only? Invitation only. Think of it as a very, very exclusive corporate entertainment, maybe okay. the nearest that we now have. Um, and the people in the audience would be dressed up to the nines as well. And after the main part of the mask was done, they would join in. Excellent stuff. In dancing. So the king, for example, would get up and join in with some dances towards the end. The king of the would mask. get up and the queen, the queen quite frequently, Queen Henrietta Maria, would take part in the mask. Excellent. In the role of a goddess or something like that. Always in a flattering role, you must understand. <laughs> and is a mask in any way related to opera? In some ways, in as much as there, it is a lot of songs and not that much dialogue, so you, you could you could say that. And the mask we that's most well known, the, the Triumph of Peace, we've got we know quite a lot about it because there are accounts of it where people describe the costumes, and I'll describe some of the costumes later. And they describe whole carts full of lutenists, for example. <laughs> um, so we, we know a lot about it. We have the whole script and some of the music. Yes, many, many of the scripts were published, weren't they, for posterity, sort of um, for they, survival. <laughs> they were, and that's why it's always easier to have words than music. In this mask, um, Shirley collaborated with his good friend William Laws. OK. And also with Ives, although his music doesn't, uh, not as much of his music connected with this survives. But it's possible because some of the music that we know is connected with the mask is then published in later collections. Next to other pieces, we can make a good guess to say that other things might be. So we will now play you a symphony from what the fourth song in the mask which mm. we have no music for the song and, and you, the song is a a song between peace and law and justice M masks are always about some grand thing like that the symphony would have been a chance for them to get on stage really it's it's a bit of scene music before they sing okay. and although it probably originally would have been played as a three-part version, and on our CD we play that version. Here it is played as a solo for Lyra Vile, performed by Alison Kinder. <laughs> You mentioned that that piece was called a symphony, but when I think of a symphony, I think of a, a very, very grand work for, a, for uh, which lasts an extremely long time for a considerable, considerably sized orchestra. Uh, what, 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 what kind of symphony is that that we just heard? Well, what this is is the meaning of the word symphony, mm -hmm. which is music sounding together. Oh, uh, okay. It's from Greek symphonos. 
Uh. And that's so therefore it's a, a symphony is a piece of music yes just a piece of music that has to be well polyphonic <laughs> that, that's right this particular one was very popular in the 17th century also on cd you'll hear richard playing this on a guitar on a, yes on a guitar and you, this was so popular that john playford who wrote the who published the first book of dances included this as a country dance called I, Me, or the Symphony. <laughs> I was very surprised when we first played this for Andrew to discover that the piece I knew as a dance was actually from a mask. Now, we'll move on to give you some songs from the mask. Mm -hmm. As I said, after the main action, the audience would join in. And so what we'll play you now is the song where the audience are being encouraged to, well, the actors be encouraged to stop now because it's time for the audience to, to get, get up and dance. Okay, okay. And this song, which is a trio sung by Emily, Peter, and Richard, with Ali and Richard playing continuo, is the has the second voice reconstructed. The part that Richard ah, so De Winter survive. sings mm -hmm. has been reconstructed by Peter Walls. OK. Why do you dwell so long in clouds and smother your best graces? Tis time you throw away those shrouds and clear your mouth. Like smiles upon the ladies here, on even terms for me their eyes, beauty and love shine there. You are to sing before delight, go kiss the hands of God. They have had their dancing, mm -hmm. and after the dancing is done, or to encourage them to finish, the next song in the mask is sung by a character called Amphiluce, and that's a word I'd never heard, so I <laughs> looked it up, and she is the morning twilight who uh. comes before the dawn, so she is saying, it's nearly daytime, time to stop dancing, time to go to bed. How abstract is that? It, it's very, very, very common in early opera as well to have um, music represented or yeah, or a certain concept represented by an actual person singing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And she had a beautiful costume. Uh, she's described as a young maid with a dim torch in her hand. Her face was an olive colour, so was her arms and breast. On her head, a curious dressing, and about her neck, a string of great pearl. Her garment was transparent, the ground dark blue and sprinkled with great pearl. <laughs> Proclaiming all to say 
Yeah. You mentioned previously the word anti-mask. I'd just like to know very quickly before before we close up, what, what is an anti-mask? It's, it's a comic interlude among the seriousness of, of the mask played by the sort of rude mechanicals that you see in Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. And in this mask... There were all sorts of characters. There was fancy and jollity. There was a tailor. There was a carpenter, a feather maker's wife in spectacular costumes. Jollity wore a flame coloured suit, but hooded a pair of bat's wings on his shoulders. And here we, because we don't have the music, okay. that we, but we know that David Davis Mel was the violinist who wrote some of the music for The Mask. And here is his Moresca, found in one of John Playford's books. That was absolutely lovely. It was great to hear the juice harp boing away right at the end. Keep my OK, on. we're coming right to the end of the show. I would like to thank the listeners for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed it very much. And thank Tamsin Lewis very much for coming in and sharing all this wonderful music with us and all of this fantastic knowledge. And we are going to leave you... What, what's the name of the song that we're going to leave with, Tamsin? It's a song from The Mask, Cupid and Death, by Christopher, and the music's by Christopher Gibbons, and it's Open Blessed Elysian Grove, A Description of Paradise. Open and blessed in the